OK, greetings from Aberdeen and wherever you are in the world. Welcome to our mini lecture. Uh, my name is Andy Welsh. I am the program coordinator for the MSc programs in medical physics and medical imaging here at the University of Aberdeen. I've also got a research interest in diagnostic nuclear medicine and a technique called positron emission tomography, which we'll talk about a bit later. I'm indebted to a couple of the lecturers that, that lecture on our MSc programmes, uh, particularly Dr. Steve McCallum from the Radiation Protection Service and Professor David Lurie, who heads up one of the MRI hardware development groups, and they've kindly let me steal some of their slides to, to make this presentation. I'm also joined by Professor Marianne van der Poel, who is a Professor of Health Economics and one of the Deputy Directors of the Health Economics Research Unit here in, in Aberdeen. And today we're going to consider a question that you maybe don't consider that often, which is how do these medical imaging techniques that, that physics geeks like me love to talk about and, and, and sing the praises of, how do they get from the, the lab into the, the clinic? Um, is it just a case of there's pretty pictures and therefore we're going to use them or should there be more to it th than that? And the way we're going to do it is I'm going to start off with a, a really a whirlwind tour of a number of different medical imaging techniques. Uh, I'm going to try and put a few of them into context. I'm going to try and compare the, the sort of differences between them, their, their strengths and their weaknesses, and the story of how they got from being uh, a twinkle in the eye of some physicist to something that's actually used in the clinic. So I'm very much going to be talking about what has happened, and then I'll hand over to Marion, who will talk about perhaps what should happen. So there's a fair bit to cover there. Um, so let's get, get straight into it. Let's go right back to the, the real the birth of medical imaging right at the start. So, so Wilhelm Röntgen, a German engineer and physicist, and, and he's working in a lab in Germany in 1895, playing with some discharge tubes. And he detects some radiation coming off these tubes that he hasn't seen before. And it has this weird property that it can transmit through things that are normally opaque. So initially he's got some cardboard that's painted black and then he's putting more dense material in front of this radiation. And it's, it, and it's very strange radiation. And in fact, in his lab book, he labels it as X radiation. Uh, he's just using X there as the, the mathematical symbol for the unknown constant. So he just means unknown radiation. And he intended that as a sort of temporary holding name for it, but it's stuck and it's become what we refer to this radiation as uh, to this day. And when he's moving around his bits of, of metal, he, at one point he puts his hand in front of the beam and sees a shadow and thinks, oh, this is quite interesting. And he starts to try and take pictures of, of people's hands. This is a picture here of one of his friends. It's not actually the first picture. The first hand he took a picture of was his wife's, um, which must have been an interesting conversation. Um, Hello, dear, can you come here? I've discovered this new sort of radiation. I have no idea what it is. Can you put your hand in front of it? Um, but he was clearly quite good at persuading people to stand in front of his, his beam of, of novel radiation. This is another image actually from the German patent office of Röntgen himself with another volunteer who's standing in front of his great big machine there that's producing X-rays and they're being transmitted through this, this volunteer uh, onto a phosphor screen and you can see an outline there of the bones and this is from, from 1895 so, so very early on. And of course, Ronkin's a physicist, an engineer, he's not a doctor, he's just demonstrating that this technique works, this, this thing, this, this radiation can be used to, to make these shadow grams, as they were called, of, of the patient. But very quickly, this is picked up by doctors around the world. And in fact, the, the first place it's used is in Glasgow Royal Infirmary here in Scotland, the first uh, radiology department that actually used this X radiation to image patients because yeah, it was clearly a revolutionary step. It's, it's the first time we've been able to look inside a patient without cutting them open, as, as simple as, as that. And it's still the most common radiological investigation today, but it was a, really a revolutionary uh, step at the time. Uh, Röntgen himself was awarded the first ever Nobel Prize in physics in 1901. And very quickly, doctors all around the world started using this as a way of looking at bones of patients uh, most most often. Um, there wasn't even really much thought given to the safety. It was just, wow, this is amazing. Let's do it. And, and in fact, by 1920, over 100 of the early radiologists in the UK had died of radiation induced cancer. Uh, and Ronkin himself dies of colon cancer in 1923. Um, so not only did Ronkin give birth to medical imaging, he also gave birth to another field that we consider in our in our MSC programs, that of, of radiation protection. So he's uh, doubly important. Uh, really. 
I'm going to jump forward now to about 75 years to the, the 1970s and in the intervening period, a number of other medical imaging techniques that have come along. Uh, the work on sonar during the war using sound waves to look for submarines in the sea, for example, has translated into the use of ultrasound in patients. Um, the, the experiments on the atomic bomb and then the, the following studies around nuclear power had given birth to what was called the atomic age and the realization that some of the byproducts of this atomic fission process were interesting molecules like iodine that could be injected into patients and that had given birth to a, a technique that we know as nuclear medicine still today. Um, but up until the 1970s, all of the techniques suffered from a, a problem that they were mostly these projection techniques. Uh, if you think about the, the way a chest X-ray works, you stand in front of an X-ray machine, a beam of X-rays is fired through the body onto a screen, and that's superimposing all of your organs onto that one two dimensional image on the screen. So there's a lot of overlay of different organs there, which makes it difficult to see what's going on. In the 1970s, we have the birth of what's called tomography, uh, what were called CAT scanners at the time. Uh, later on, we'll have PET scanners and CAT scanners. So that's clearly a, a theme emerging there. Uh, but these commuted tomography scanners and tomography is formed from two Greek words, tomos and graphia. Tomos meaning slice and graphia to record. So it literally means recording slices through the patient. And this technique, which is much more expensive than the standard X-ray techniques, but it's again really revolutionary because it allows us to look at these slices through the patient and the images and the organs are no longer superimposed on each other. So we're getting much clearer images of, of the structure inside the patients there. Um, and you can see how revolutionary this is. The, the first CT scanner, Hounsfield's original EMI scanner is still in the Science Museum in London. If you want to go and have a look at it, I've been there myself to have a, have a look at it. It's quite an amazing feat to see that old machine sitting there. Uh, first used clinically in 1971 and then by 1977 there's already over a thousand of these machines used across the world. So although it's much more expensive than Ronkin's original x-ray machines, it's revolutionary again and it's clearly very quickly adopted uh, into the clinic. I've been talking so far mostly about techniques that use x-rays but it's worth bearing in mind that there are lots of different properties of tissues that can be used to form medical imaging, a really long list that, that we can look at. And it's not always obvious why those properties are medically useful. In fact, even x-rays, when, when you think about it carefully, they're measuring electron density. And it's not immediately obvious why electron density is a useful property to measure, but they're giving us an idea about density, as, as the name implies there. And therefore, they're very good at looking at dense things like bones, for example, and we've all probably seen examples of x-rays of, of bone fractures. They're also very good at looking at things like tumours because tumours tend to be quite dense compared with their surroundings, particularly something like a lung tumour, quite dense compared with its surroundings, and other tumours are also quite dense. And they're good at looking at things like atherosclerotic plaques, which are build up of calcifications, but they're not very good at looking at soft tissue contrast. So for example, in the brain, the brain, as far as x-rays are concerned, is a fairly uniform mush of, of things that, that are the same density. Uh, whereas actually we know there's big differences between the, the, the tissues in the brain, the gray and the white matter, for example. There are other properties of tissues that can be used to form images. Uh, and one that's sort of close to all of our hearts is the, the magnetic resonance principles and the magnetic relaxation properties that can be used to form images. And it was known since the 1950s that these properties were biologically quite useful and, and could be used to form images of tissues. Um, so on the face of it, it looks like we have a technique here which has taken a bit longer to get to the clinic, but there's a good reason for that. Uh, if we go to the 1970s uh, in, in Aberdeen, certainly Professor Mallard here has put together a team of people uh, to build uh, MRI machines to investigate this phenomenon that had been known about since the 1950s. Uh, the group, along with other groups, have produced a nice image of a dead mouse I'll come back to that dead aspect in a minute. And based on that, Prof Mallard takes the really quite uh, ambitious step of building a full size human scanner. And I say it's ambitious. It's ambitious because the technique worked very nicely on things that were dead, but not very nicely on things that were alive. And it's not a terribly good sales pitch for your imaging technique to say, I can get really good pictures of patients, but they have to be dead first. Um, and the problem is that as soon as there's any motion, in those days in the in the image and that includes something as simple as blood flow the, the blood pulsing around in your your veins and arteries or respiratory motion it caused massive artifacts that completely ruined the image so 
MRI was a technique that was known to be potentially quite useful, but it hadn't been used clinically simply because it, it only worked if the subject was dead, which is definitely a negative uh, side of this. Of course, in 1980, uh, Edelstein and Hutchison working here in Aberdeen. In fact, they were the two people viewed on the scanner. Jim Hutchison was actually in the scanner on that previous picture, um, developed what was called spin warp imaging. And this completely revolutionizes MRI as a clinical tool because it's a technique that allows you to get rid of that, that artifact that completely ruins the image. And suddenly you can get these really beautiful images of, of cross sections of the body. And in fact, spin warp is still used on every MRI scanner in the world uh, today. Um, and as soon as that happens, as soon as that technique is developed, it completely unlocks the use of MRI. Uh, here's a picture of, of Frank Smith bringing a patient to that original scanner through the snow in Aberdeen, because of course at this point the scanner is in a basement and the physicists are, are playing with it and the doctors have to bring their patients across, in this case, through the snow uh, to, to get those scans done. But as soon as that, that spin warp technique is developed, it's immediately obvious that this is going to be a very useful uh, clinical technique. And in fact, if we go back to the Science Museum, just, just down the corridor from that uh, EMI CT scanner, we have an example of a Mallard system MRI scanner developed by M&D Technology, which is a spin out company that Professor Mallard uh, developed to build and sell these scanners. And this is an example of a scanner that was installed in London in a St. Bartholomew's Hospital, only three years after spin warps developed and used for 10 years, over which time yeah, MRI has really exploded worldwide. And that scanner in the Science Museum is actually a Mark II scanner. If you want to see the Mark I scanner, you'll have to come to Aberdeen. It's still sitting in a glass case in, in Aberdeen Royal Infirmary. But it's a, a technique that was used very quickly once the initial, once the key uh, problem was solved, that of imaging living subjects. So finally, for my part, I want to talk about a subject very close to my heart. Uh, it's, it's positron emission tomography and, and the story of the development of that. So far, we've been talking, I've been talking about techniques that image the, the structure of the body so that we can image things like fractures and we can image things like uh, the different densities of tissues. So all of these techniques effectively are trying to replicate what happens if you cut the body open and take a picture. That's almost a sort of definition of medical imaging in, in many people's minds, trying to replicate what you'd get if you cut the patient open and, and, and took a photograph. But those are just looking at density of, of structure of, of tissues. Another way of imaging the body is to look at the function, to look at the way in which the body's behaving, um, physiological and metabolic processes. And we've had a number of techniques for a number of years that could, could study function, but PET really revolutionized things by being the first technique that could image glucose metabolism. It was the first technique that allowed us to actually image sugar and where sugar went in the body. And glucose metabolism is an incredibly useful thing clinically to image because lots of processes and diseases affect glucose metabolism. Uh, tumours have a higher glucose metabolism than their surrounding tissues in, in most cases, not all, but most. Um, a heart disease affects your cardiac energetics, your metabolism of your heart. Uh, dementia affects brain function and, and the metabolism of your brain. So this ability to image glucose is really a powerful way of imaging the function of the body as opposed to the, the structure. The problem is to make radio labeled forms of glucose that we can image, we need a particle accelerator, which is a not particularly cheap machine and a chemistry lab to make these traces. So although the actual PET scanners are no more expensive than MRI scanners, for example, uh, that, those traces that we use to inject are actually themselves very expensive, between 500 to 1,000 pounds for every study that we do. And that's a real tipping point in terms of healthcare providers. And this is the point where healthcare providers start getting very nervous about the cost of all these fancy whiz-bang uh, imaging devices. Notwithstanding that, Prof Mallard again is very keen to try and develop PET as a technique and uh, over a few years begs, borrows and in some cases steals various bits of equipment and puts together a, a PET research group in Aberdeen again in 1985, so very early in the, in the day. Um, but the story of a PET's translation from that laboratory technique into a clinical one is, is quite a long one. I'm not going to go through every part of the slide, it's quite busy I'm afraid, but it gives a sort of timeline of the development of PET here in Scotland at least. So from Prof Mallard setting up that original research group in 1985. I actually arrived in Aberdeen in 1997, sorry. And my first job was to design what then became the John Mallard Pet Centre for Pet Research, uh, now named the John Mallard Scottish Pet Centre. 
that was opened by the Minister for Health in, in 1998. And I was the director of that until about 2012, so the, the period that's covered by this. And in about 2001, the health department in Scotland say, well, this, this PET technique's looking quite interesting. Perhaps we better look into that. And they asked the Health Technology Board for Scotland to investigate this more carefully. Uh, they released their report in 2002 saying, yes, it looks like quite a useful technique. Uh, but then it still takes a number of years and various implementation groups and reports to be produced until we actually in March 2006 produced the first NHS scan in Scotland uh, up here in Aberdeen. Uh, and since then, the technique has really become quite widely established. It's still a very expensive technique and therefore not used everywhere, but we have PET scanners in Scotland now, as well as Aberdeen, in Glasgow, Edinburgh and Dundee. And that university research group that was set up by Prof Malab right back in 1985 has now been absorbed into NHS Grampian and the PET centre is an integral part of the, the hospital there. But that step of, of actually trying to find the evidence, the Health Technology Board for Scotland uh, exercise to try and look for the evidence was quite a complicated one. I was one of the people on the panel for that Health Technology Board for Scotland review and we found it very challenging to actually come up with the evidence. The problem is there were lots of papers that showed that PET was accurate and we could and we published a number ourselves saying, look, it's more accurate than CT for, for diagnosing this particular cancer, for example. And a number of groups had published those papers, but hardly anybody had looked at the outcome of that and saying, well, does that actually make a difference in, in terms of the outcome of the patient, which is the thing that you really want to know to prove that your technique is useful. And in particular, there were no large scale randomized control trials, for example. So these are the sort of gold standard for, for proving that something's useful, where you randomize your population, half of them get the investigation and half of them don't. And you see down the line whether that actually makes a difference to the, the outcome for those patients. And it wasn't because people didn't understand the value of those. We certainly ourselves known that was a great value in doing these sort of trials. The problem was it was very difficult to get anybody to agree to do them. We found that as soon as we showed a doctor an image of their patient on our PET scanner with some interesting disease process being being highlighted, they became very reluctant to engage in any trial that involved denying some patients that that technology. It was seen instantly as being must be useful because that's how imaging technology have been adopted over the years. It looks good. Let's use it. And they were then very reluctant to actually um, deny any patients that in order to get the data that we needed in order to prove that it really was uh, useful long term. The solutions actually lay in modelling and that's something that, that Mariana is going to pick up a bit more on now. So I will hand over to her at this point. OK, thanks, Andy. Um, so if you can go to the next slide. OK, so I'm sure we're all very excited by all of all of all that imaging and what imaging can do. Um, but I really want to address the question whether we should be using imaging in a, a publicly funded healthcare system like the NHS. Um, and as Andy mentioned, like these techniques are getting more and more expensive. And of course, there have been concerns around efficiency and affordability really since the birth of the NHS. Uh, but kind of in the due to the increase in healthcare costs, this concern has come even more to the forefront. And the issue really is that, of course, we have a limited budget for healthcare uh, and arguably unlimited wants with what we want to do with it. Um, so we really need to make choices as to what healthcare we provide, how we provide it, in one, what quantities and how it should be distributed. So we really need to ask the question in terms of imaging, but for example, PET scans, like do these represent good value for money and therefore should we provide them in a, a publicly funded healthcare system? Um, so next slide, please. So the way we as health economists think about it is really in terms of what the opportunity costs are. Um, so if we have a limited budget, we have to make choices. So we need to think what else could we be doing with that money that we are spending on imaging? Um, so and th this is what we call the opportunity cost. And therefore, by spending the money on, in this case, for example, PET scans, we are giving up the benefits of what we would have received if we had spent it in another way. Um, so if we take the example of, say, about 25 PET scans, it costs uh, roughly around £12,500 on the NHS. So what else could we have done with that money? 
Uh, and here are just some examples on the, on the slide. So we, we could have um, funded a cochlear implant, for example, a heart bypass operation, 15 cataract removals, or 900 vaccinations for measles, mumps, and rubella. But actually, we need to think much wider even than healthcare because this is public money. We could also use that money, for example, to employ a junior school teaching assistant for a year. Uh, very topical at the moment. We could use the money to provide 830 school meal vouchers. Uh, or we could even think about spending that some of that money on, on buying a new military tank. So next slide, please. So to understand why whether kind of uh, PET scans or any imaging techniques are a good use of money, we need to get a good handle of what the benefits are. So this is Andy, what Andy already referred to. And we need to understand what the health benefits are. So, of course, imaging itself will not produce direct health improvements. It's about improving the diagnostic accuracy, which might then improve the choices we make in terms of treatments or choosing more appropriate treatments and therefore improving the health outcomes of patients. So the benefits of imaging are really kind of further down the, the, the patient pathway, the disease pathway. Uh, and as Ma Andy mentioned, there is, it's a real challenge to kind of find robust evidence on effectiveness if we don't have randomized controlled trials. Uh, and what we do in, in health economics is we try to model almost like the, the, the disease pathway and the changes in disease pathway uh, as a result of imaging. So we try and, and predict what might happen in terms of different treatment choices and therefore the uh, improvement in health over the patient's lifetime. I think the interesting aspect also as, as for us as economists is about, well, is it actually just health benefits that patients and the public value or is there more than that? Um, and of course, imaging um, provides information and it may be the case that patients and the public actually value that information, even if, if the information itself does not lead to any changes in treatment. So actually knowing the diagnosis, for example, uh, may be of value to, to the public and patients. And here the challenge is that, well, how do we measure and quantify this kind of to what extent people value information? And here at Aberdeen, we've been at the forefront of, of developing and applying a, a survey technique called the, the discrete choice experiments. Uh, and that does exactly that. We can understand the relative importance and how people trade off different aspects of benefits, such as value of information and, and health benefits. So next slide, please. So I thought I would just finish with an example of how research here at the University of Aberdeen, the Health Economics Research Unit, has influenced how we use imaging on the NHS. Uh, and the example here is by my colleague, Graeme Scotland, um, who looks at diabetic retinop retinopathy screening. Um, so people with diabetes are at a higher risk of getting this. And if it's left untreated, this then can cause blindness or damage to the eyesight. So in 2005 in Scotland, an annual screening program was introduced. So all individuals with diabetes were invited um, and they used an imaging technique called digital retinal photography. So basically it takes photographs of the, the back of the eyes to see if there's any damage. And with the increase in the number of people who have diabetes, there were concerns around the cost and efficiency of this screening program. Because what they found was that actually the majority of people don't have any damage um, when they are being screened. So the question really was, can we improve the efficiency of this by uh, shifting to biannual screening for people who are low risk? And in this case, low risk was people who were, when they were screened, there were no problems on two consecutive occasions. So what happens if we shift to biannual for, for these people, for these low risk people? And so my colleague and, and his co-authors then used economic model, modeling to try and predict what the cost and benefits are with shifting to biannual for low risk. Uh, and what they estimated was resource savings worth around 3 million over two year period, so quite a lot. And yes, there were very slight reductions in our measure of health benefit, which is quality just live years, but the cost savings greatly outweighed any slight reductions. 
Uh, and as a result, the National Screening Committee in the UK adopted this policy. So it really is a nice example of how our research here at Aberdeen has influenced and how economics has influenced how we use imaging uh, on the NHS. Uh, and to, to ensure that the kind of limited resources we have uh, are used in a more efficient way. So next slide, please. So we really just want to open up for questions. I will hand back to Andy, but yeah, hopefully this has made you even more interested in imaging and health economics. Um, here you see a range of programs that we have on offer at Aberdeen. So if you're interested in imaging and I'm see medical physics or medical imaging, uh, in terms of health economics, we have an online MSc in health economics for health professionals. Uh, we also offer a short course in health economics online, uh, which will start this January. Um, here are our email addresses as well, if you want to contact us further. But yes, I'll hand back to Andy now. Andy, you're on mute. You'll just need to unmute. You know, we've been in lockdown since March and I still every day forget to put my, my microphone back off. Uh, thanks, Marianne. So I'm going to end the slideshow there and um, I'll hopefully try to, to moderate this session on um, question and answer session there. Uh, I see that we've got uh, at least one question in there on medical imaging that I should take from, I think, Skylar Reese. Is that right? Hi, Skylar. Good to see you and thanks for your question. Well, good to hear from you. So the question there is to what extent is medical imaging an engineering or instrument design field to compare to say an anatomy physiology one? And that's I'm just speaking as an astrophysics student. Uh, I'm a physicist by, by training, so astrophysics, that sounds great to me. Um, this is a really uh, complicated and, and interesting question because medical imaging expands a lot of different aspects. Um, there's a big component from, from my point of view, from the physics point of view, and I think most of my talk focused on that. It, it's very much a, an engineering instrument design physics field you know it, it's it's the engineers the, the designers that, that that actually design invent develop and build these machines and that's happening to this day you know um, I, I talked about some of the historic things that have that have gone on but uh, as I said uh, briefly at the start here in Aberdeen we still have a very active MRI uh, hardware group led by Professor Lurie developing uh, fast field cycling MRI, which is the, the next generation of, of MRI scanners. So that work is still going on in, in universities such as ours and, and many others. It's also going on actively in companies around the world, you know, the large imaging companies, Siemens, GE, Philips, and, and some of the smaller companies, startup companies as well, are developing new imaging techniques. And there are lots of techniques still out there to be developed. You know, we've just started probing the body in interesting ways and there's lots of other interesting ways that that you can probe the body as well but it is also an anatomy physiology one because the, the use of imaging is a, a key part of, of what we do so uh, our msc in medical imaging and our medical physics mscs we do talk about the technology quite a lot particularly the medical physics one we talk a lot about the go quite deeply into the the physics of these machines, how they work, how they're designed, the engineering around them, the, the questions that are still out there to be answered in terms of, of improvements and, and the new techniques that are coming along are covered in those, those courses quite a lot. Um, but certainly in the medical imaging program as well, we talk a lot more about the application side of it as well. So how do you use these machines? That's a very interesting and open question, you know, not just what they are and how they work, but how should you use them? What is the best technique for studying uh, brain cancer? What's the best technique for studying heart disease? What's the best way of looking at different processes? So those different programs are designed to, to do those different things. And the physics one going much more deeply into the physics and the imaging one uh, looking more at the applications side of, of how we might use them. There is quite a lot of overlap. There's a lot of common courses, but that's the, the sort of basic thing there. Um, I think um, there's one from Marianne, Marianne here about uh, are diagnostics such as imaging and new drugs treated in the same way when deciding? I think maybe I'll hand it back to you, Marianne, to talk about that, <laughs> that difference between drugs and, and imaging. Which is like... OK, thanks, Andy. Um, I guess first to say is that in the UK, both England and Scotland, we do have now national bodies that make decisions about whether new new treatments should be provided on the NHS or not. And they will look at both the effectiveness and cost effectiveness of these new treatments compared to standard treatments. 
So I, w- I would say if it's a new imaging technique, that will probably be treated the same way. Um, so if it's a new imaging technique that want, that they want to introduce on the NHS, then that will be treated the same way in terms of looking at the evidence on effectiveness and cost effectiveness. Um, I think the issue is potentially that there are already a lot of imaging techniques out there. And what we tend to do less is um, actually assessing whether what we are currently doing, whether that's a good idea or not in terms of effectiveness and cost effectiveness. So it's looking at existing rather than new techniques. I think we do slightly better in Scotland. So in Scotland, as, as Andy mentioned, we have the health technologies group and they, they do look at a range of interventions, including existing interventions. Um, and imaging techniques are definitely one of them that that will be considered in terms of looking at the evidence. Of course, the question then is if there's no no robust evidence, what do you do? Do you withdraw uh, what you're currently <laughs> providing or not? Um, generally not, I would say. So it's always harder to withdraw than to say no to something new. Um, but yeah, so I think it very much depends on, on whether it's it's new or an existing treatment. Thanks, Brian. Yeah, I, I think that's it's always been something that's interested me as well, this difference between the, the drugs and the imaging, mm-hmm. because, you know, the way a drug is brought into the, the health services is, is much more regulated and you have to have a randomised control trial. You have to go through phase one, phase two and phase three. And then when you come up with a new drug that does the same thing as your old drug, but might be slightly better, you have to go for that whole process again. And, and that doesn't happen with imaging. If, if we look at the techniques I've talked about that are already being used in the clinic, they're being improved all the time. Every 10 years or so, we'll, we'll buy a new scanner. You know, we're on our third or fourth PET scanner. I've lost count now. Um, but every time you, you buy a new scanner, the manufacturers who are trying to sell this scanner to you are saying, look at this scanner. It's much better than the old one you've got. It's, it's much improved. It's a bit more expensive, but it's much better. Uh, and we're mm-hmm. not collecting that same robust evidence that you would have to for a drug to say Mark 3 of the PET scanner is actually justified over Mark 2. Um, so that's a really interesting question that I think needs a lot more exploration. I, th- I think it would be interesting if, if, if a completely new imaging technique would be developed. I don't know if that's, I'm sure that's possible. Yeah. Um, I think I think that would be treated quite differently. So if something completely new came on the market, um, I think that would be looked at very closely in terms of the evidence. So. Yeah, well, I guess we have that in Aberdeen with the, the fast field cycling MRI developments that are going on. That's, that's a really a new, mm-hmm. I mean, it's based on MRI, but it's really a whole new imaging technique in the way that the things that it can do, it's, it's quite amazing. So that'll be that'll be quite good to look at. And there's another question here for me, I guess, um, mentioned that modelling was used as part of the evidence for introduction of PET and expanding on that a bit more. I think that's an interesting question, Susan, thanks. Uh, yeah, I think uh, Mario mentioned that modelling is used quite a lot and certainly in the Health Technology Board for Scotland, exercise that we did on PET uh, back in in the sort of 2000, 2001 era, that was used quite heavily. Um, basically what you're trying to do there is, is model what the impact is of your, your, your intervention. So you're saying, well, we can take the PET scan. We know that it's this accurate. So we know that it gets this many tests right and it gets this many tests wrong. What does that now mean if I take a patient who's got lung cancer, for example, and it's very specific to different conditions, but take a patient who's got lung cancer. I know what the normal process is for that patient in terms of the treatment that they would get, and I know how expensive all those treatments are. I can now say if I do a PET scan and a certain percentage of those PET scans are going to turn out to show that the disease is more extensive than I thought it was, it's spread further than I thought it was because PET is very sensitive for detecting spread and therefore those patients won't go on and have surgery because it will no longer be relevant to those patients whereas they would have done in the past and you can model that quite nicely with these economic models to say well what does that save you in terms of of the cost of the surgery but also in terms of these quality adjusted life years that that, that Marion mentioned and the number of extra years of, of life a patient might get weighted by how unwell they might be, which is a rather strange term, but used quite a lot in, in health economics. So that was something that we looked at. I think the problem with it is the old problem with models is the it depends on the quality of your data. You know, I think we're seeing that a lot with, with coronavirus now and a lot of talk about the models and, and predicting, you know, the number of deaths there's going to be. But it all dep- depends on the quality of the evidence you feed into that model. And I think that's certainly something we found with, with that PET experience was there wasn't a great deal of really robust evidence to put into the front end of the model. The models are great, but they rely on on having the right data. So I don't want to fall off on that at all, Marion. 
Well, you did you did a very good job, and <laughs> yeah. I could tell you how thick on it. I don't <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we call it economic models, but actually they're quite complicated mathematical models often uh, yes. where we then feed in, yeah. in, in our cost and, and benefits. So, um, but yeah, it's very much rubbish in, rubbish out. So if we've got rubbish yeah. data, what we're go going to get out is not very good. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. That's true. Um, so I don't know if we've got any more questions that, that people want us to answer. We're, we're happy to take any more that you might have. Um, I'll give it a little bit of time. I guess we're getting close toward the end of our allotted time period. But Hi, Andy. There's a question in from Lionel about tomography and PET. Oh, I can't see that. Oh, sorry, you're right. Lionel, sorry. Um, yes. Why well, he said tomography and PET look very different, took very different time to be accepted by the medical community. Why has PET taken decades when tomography disseminated within years? Yeah, thanks, Lionel. I think that's um that's a really interesting question. Um, I think it comes down a bit to cost. I think the fact that PET was a sort of step change in in expense compared with other techniques, uh, and it's because you have to make these radioactive traces in your particle accelerator. So, you know, being able to image the body using glucose is an amazingly powerful thing to do, but making a radio labeled version of glucose is not cheap, and, and it's costing a lot more. Um, to do that study because of that. So where well, the MRI techniques, the MRI scanners are expensive, but once you've bought one, you've got it and you've got to staff it, of course, but it's the, the ongoing costs are not as high. Uh, the problem with PET is there is that jump in, in cost. Um, it's also a technique that uses radio tracers, so there's a safety app aspect to that as well, but that actually mostly leads into more cost. You need more safety features around that to, to get there. So I think that's part of the story that it, that it's it was just a little bit more expensive than all the things that had come before and therefore the health provider started to say we're not sure we can really afford this. Um, the other thing is is just a time issue. It, it was a, the, the next one in a long line. You know the, the health providers had already introduced X-ray imaging and then CT and then MRI and we, ultrasound was there and, and gamma cameras were there and lots of things were there already and, and there was a sort of sense of well we can't keep buying everything that the physicists come and turn out of, of their offices all the time. It is actually quite interesting as well I think that the differences in the different markets uh, we've been talking a lot about the, the Scottish market and, and the UK National Health Service and the way they we do things here it's very different in other markets. I worked for a number of years in, in the States, for example, where they've got very much a private health market. And there the sort of uptake of PET was really driven much more by advertising effectively um, from the, the providers. So, so the people that were marketing PET scanners and the people that were research groups like ours in some ways were producing quite effective advertisements for, for PET. I've got some a few brochures on my on my shelf that are uh, called the, the power of PET and imaging for hope women's voices for PET which was developed by an American group looking at, at the use of PET in, in breast cancer and, and um, gynecological cancers and the PET, PET the power of molecular imaging which has images of Ronald Reagan's brain looking at the Alzheimer's there and then you know, these were really very powerful bits of advertising because in that market the way you got the, the thing accepted was to generate the demand from patients who would then put pressure on their health insurance providers to to reimburse for this. So it is very much market dependent. So that's a rather long and complicated answer to a short question. Lynn. <laughs> so I, don't know if I scrolled down enough. Is there any more at the bottom there? Oh, look at that. I've got another question from my own. Is, routine, is efficiency routinely considered when deciding what healthcare to provide? Okay, on, that's, that's yeah, I guess I guess we've already covered that um, in terms of yeah talking about national decision making bodies in terms of considering evidence on effectiveness and cost effectiveness uh, when new at least when new treatments come onto the market. So, um, but yeah, just to pick up on the point of kind of different healthcare systems, because that's a, that's a very important point, I think. So the way healthcare is funded will very much then shape kind of what care is provided. Uh, and I think Australia is another one where we have a lot of private health insurance and the use of diagnostic is much higher there. So, um, yeah, so it will how these decisions are being made will depend on, on the healthcare system and whether it's a publicly funded system through tax. 
like we have in the in the UK is quite different from if we have a, a more private healthcare market. So um. yeah, no, I think it's very interesting. I don't know if we've got any any um, people joining us from the states, but I, I always found it fascinating when I was living over there because there's a bit of control on the sort of advertising you can do um, but often you sort of generate demand by having these adverts that say ask your doctor about x or y uh, mm -hmm. often not really clear what x or y is i watched quite a few adverts in, in the middle of american football matches for example where telling me i should ask my doctor about rogaine i think it might have been a hair restorer i don't, don't remember it was never said in the advert what it was it was just trying to generate that kind of um, enthusiasm in the market to to ask your doctor whether you should have this and then put the pressure on the healthcare providers to provide that so it is very different how different markets work and, and very interesting probably a whole uh, study there on its own well, we, we cover it in health economics so there if you, you study go. health <laughs> economics you, you, you hear more about it so you want to know more come and study health economics <laughs> Anything else we have to consider? Oh, hang on. I have heard the links. There you go. So there's some links there for, for studying. If you want to come here, um, click on those links. You can actually look at the, you can type in the program names and, and find our program pages. You'll also on there find links to our email addresses, I think, under those programs as well. So you can ask us any questions. So I think we're coming towards the end of our time. I don't know if there's any more. So very happy to answer any more questions if there are, but uh, as I say, you've got the links there. Um, you're more than welcome to get in touch with any of us to, to ask about the programs and just about the subject in general. Always happy to, to talk about these subjects, of course. Um, but I guess if we've got no more questions coming in on the chat, um, I don't know if there's anything else that we should be covering. Oh, we do have a a new one that I don't think has come through on the moderation yet. So I might actually slightly cheat and go and look in uh, something that Stephen has talked about. Is MRI focused more in our curriculum or do we cover all imaging modalities equally? So I guess that's a question for me about the medical imaging and the medical physics uh, MSc programs. Um, no, I'd say we cover the modalities fairly equally, although probably equally things are never equally in terms of, of their in, importance, I guess. Um, there, there are basically deeper studies, we call them. So in the first phase of your MSc program, you do an imaging in medicine course that covers all of the imaging modalities. So it covers MRI, it covers diagnostic radiology, it covers nuclear medicine, it covers ultrasound. And then in the second phase for the medical physics students, they take deeper studies where they go really quite deeply into each of the modalities. So there's one on MRI, there's one on nuclear medicine, and there's, there's one on diagnostic radiology uh, and radiation protection. So you go quite deeply into those modalities. For the medical imaging students, we have uh, courses that are called, a new course that's called comparative imaging that, that I'm setting up this year, where we compare all the different imaging techniques with each other. So we, 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 we're looking at them to see what is the most useful technique for a particular task. So that's really a sort of task focused type of thing. So it depends a little bit on what MSc program you, you, you're talking about. But if you've got any questions about the programs, you know, please just drop me an email at any time and I'm, I'm happy to give you the sort of uh, full story on that and also what might be specific to you and the, the questions you might have. So. OK, so I guess that probably is it. It looks like we've reached, reached the 445, which is when we, we said we would end the session and there's no more questions in there. So I'd just like to thank you all for coming along and for those very interesting questions. I, I hope you enjoyed it. I'd like to thank Marianne as well for, for joining me here and helping me out with this, this session. Um, and if you've got any questions, please get in touch. We'll, we'll leave it there. Sorry, Andy, I might just get you to go. There is a new question. Oh, is there a new question? All yeah. oh, right. Oh, um, Scala, hi, Scala, back again. <laughs> Sorry to ask another. Please give us short on time. Ah, oh, no, we can manage it. How does this differ from MSc in biomedical engineering? Oh, that's a difficult thing. So I think if you mean in Aberdeen, so we, there is a new MSc in biomedical engineering, which has been started in Aberdeen um, by Ed Chadwick this year. Um, the biomedical engineering is really, I suppose, a clinical engineering thing. So it's really focused more around the, the role of people who look after the equipment in the NHS. So the equipment maintenance and the equipment management aspects and it covers things that sort of go beyond what we would traditionally cover in an imaging course. So things like ECGs, you know, electrocardiograms and blood pressure monitoring and, and those sort of 
what you could class as one dimensional imaging, if you like, but those simple sort of time sequence type imaging, me measuring blood pressure, measuring heart rate, uh, measuring other activity as well. Uh, so it covers the range of the equipment that's used and those sort of equipment management type, type tasks. So it's it's really focused around that. There is some commonality. There's at least one course that's shared between all three of the MSCs, the, the one on biomedical topics uh, is covered in all three. Um, but that's just hopefully a, a, a brief idea. Uh, I have a vague idea of what I want. Imaging sounds pretty close. Don't worry, I had a vague idea of what I want. I still got a vague idea of what I want. That's that's not a problem. Um, but yeah, imaging does does mesh physics and anatomy for healthcare. I think you, you summarized it fairly well there. And so I think the biomedical engineering is really more. Biomedical engineering is a slightly strange term because sometimes it can include other things like uh, artificial hips, uh, things like that as well. So the, the use of, of engineering to to help people. Um, so that would, that would come under biomedical engineering in a way that it wouldn't under imaging. So hopefully that covered it, Skylar. But yeah, please just get in touch. If you've got any more questions, always happy to talk about that. So I guess that probably does bring us to the end. Um, so thank you all for your time and I hope it was interesting and enjoyable. So we'll sign off now. <laughs>